Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we are going to have Chris Rowe of Rowe Hunting Resources, and we're going to be doing a, a multi part series on Western turkey hunting. And this first episode is going to be on scouting turkeys and everything you need to know about scouting turkeys in Western states. And quite honestly, uh, even people in back east can use these uh, tactics uh, and tips. And we're going to also be covering roosting strategies uh, in, in future episodes, uh, early morning roost setups, midday setups, uh, late afternoon setups. Uh, we're going to be talking about calling. We have a great episode where I've pulled in a bunch of audio from real turkeys themselves. And Chris and I go over each one of the calls and the situations. And that's going to be a great one. We're talking about decoys. Uh, we've got a lot of st uh, great stuff in this series. Uh, so make sure you don't miss it. I also, before we get to that, though, I want to remind you of a few things and bring a few things up here. Uh, April 5th is the deadline for the Colorado Big Game applications. And uh, I also want to tell you about there is an Arizona raffle turkey tag. Uh, there's a year-long Arizona raffle turkey tag. Hannah Gould's Merriam's a Rio Grande turkey from August 15th, 2016 to August 14th of 2017. Uh, $20 a card. The local Arizona uh, chapters of the NWTF are selling 10 decks of cards, so 520 cards at a price of $20 a card. And they're going to be a drawing on August 1st uh, for the year-long tag. Second place is actually going to win a uh, Savage Axis XP243 rifle with a 3 to 9 by 40 scope. It's open to residents and non-residents. Uh, you can purchase as many cards as you like. Uh, the winner may designate to whom the tag will be issued. Uh, you can contact Steve Sams at 928-848-4549. Uh, the other thing that I want to tell you about is there is a great YouTube channel out there uh, that I have found called White Bone Creations. And uh, White Bone Creations uh, owner is Ryan Olson. And Ryan lives in Southern California. And on this YouTube channel, he's covering all sorts of hunts uh, from hog hunts to turkey hunts to uh, whitetail deer in Wyoming to pronghorn. Uh, the guy's a fishing fanatic and actually I've got a, a podcast episode that I've shot with him and it's going to be uh, coming here soon. Uh, but check him out on YouTube uh, at Whitebone Creations. Uh, also pretty exciting, uh, Ryan in turn got me in touch with a friend of his uh, Robert Arrington that has a YouTube channel uh, deer meat for dinner and I've also done an episode with him you can find Robert at deermeatfordinner.com or deer meat for dinner on YouTube and uh, both of these guys uh, provided excellent episodes that are going to be coming up here on the J Scott Outdoors podcast so I want to thank them and I want to encourage you guys to check them out I want to thank you guys, the listeners, for all your support that you give to my podcast. Uh, the best thing you can do for me uh, is spread the word and uh, tell your friends, uh, link uh, on Facebook and uh, share where you can and spread, spread the news about uh, my podcast, the J. Scott Outdoors Western Big Game Hunting and Fishing Podcast. I appreciate all the emails, all the positive uh, emails and, and uh, comments, uh, all the questions that you guys send me. Uh, feel free if you've got anything you want to discuss or talk about or any comments to email me at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. You can follow along on our website, jscottoutdoors.com, our guiding website, Colburn and Scott Outfitters.com, our Gould's Turkey specific. We do Gould's Turkey Hunts in Mexico, Gould'sTurkeyHunt.com. Uh, of course, our Instagram channel, at J. Scott Outdoors and at Dar Colburn, my associate. And uh, just want to thank you guys sincere, sincerely for uh, just all of the unbelievable support uh, that you guys show this podcast. Also like to thank uh, my sponsors, uh, Wilderness Athlete, Western Hunter, and Elk Hunter Magazines. 
uh, phone scope outdoorsman's utah hydrographics and my title sponsor is gohunt.com insider and gohunt.com insider is by far the most valuable tool for a western hunter uh, could give themselves they're an industry leader and number one source for western hunting uh, for a lot of reasons. They have changed the game for how hunts and hunting information is found. Within a matter of minutes, using the filtering 2.0, you'll be able to filter state uh, by state, species, residency, odds of drawing a tag, specific hunting dates, harvest success percentages to find the hunts that fit exactly what you're looking for. Uh, if you're the guy that applies all across the West or just in your home state, uh, there's lots of great little nuggets of information within the Go Hunt Insider uh, to find new opportunities and new places to hunt. Uh, there's no better way to do it than using the Go Hunt Insider. As an exclusive offer to my listeners, if you sign up using the J. Scott promo code, uh, you, you will receive a $50 Kuyu gift card. And you can use that Kuyu gift card at kuyu.com and uh, buy some great gear. So head on over to gohunt.com forward slash insider and get yourself the most valuable membership a hunter could have. Guys, let's get right to this episode with Chris Rowe. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we've got a special episode with the one and only Chris Rowe of <laughs> Rowe Hunting Resources. <laughs> I, I think that might be a blessing for a lot of people. <laughs> The one and only Chris Rowe, uh, always great to have you on the podcast, buddy, and today we're going to be talking about uh, western turkey hunting, uh, you know, pretty much all the western states between Merriam's and Rio's uh, primarily, and uh, we'll talk about all the different setups and roosting strategies and uh, calling and scouting and all those different things. I'm excited to have you on the podcast. How are you doing? Doing all right, my friend. How you been? Oh, doing just great. I'm getting uh, excited for the upcoming spring turkey season. Going to be chasing a bunch of Merriams, going to be chasing a bunch of Goulds. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't make it out to California this year to hunt the Rios, but uh, I know you've got a slug of Rio hunts in front of you, and I know you're a, a veteran of hunting the mountain birds, uh, the Merriams in New Mexico and Colorado. So, uh, I'm excited to have you on to give your perspective uh, on this. On th These episodes may turn into a two-part series, uh, three-part series. It's just hard to say. Uh, we're going to try and be as comprehensive as we can, and I'm excited to have you on here. Nice. No, I think it's be fun. I, I've looked over, you know, for those that are listening, yeah, we, Jay sent me an outline of what kind of what he's thinking, and my gosh, this, this should be a, I think it's probably going to end up being a two-parter at least, and I, it's going to be a a nice comprehensive overview of pretty much everything that we know. So, <laughs> absolutely. Well, let's start off with scouting and uh, when to. We're going to talk about when to scout for turkeys, how to scout for turkeys, and where to scout for turkeys. On the when to scout for turkeys, you know, typically here in Arizona, scouting our seasons usually start about the third week in April. Uh, sometime, you know, usually that 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, somewhere in there is when the season starts. And I like to tell people that, you know, by April 1st, you know, when the sn snow starts melting uh, on years we have snow, yeah. Uh, yeah. when the sn snow starts melting and the turkeys break up from their winter flocks, I think that's usually a good time to be out and listening at the prime hours, which, you know, I always say are, you know, 30 minutes before the sun comes up, 30 minutes after the sun comes up. And also in the evening, you know, that last 30 minutes of light and then probably, the you know, after it's actually dark, then 30 minutes after. Those are kind of the best times in my mind to be out listening for birds. And I know that you know, you've had quite a bit of experience in New Mexico uh, chasing birds, and I was curious what your thoughts are on birds chasing that snow line and when you think it's effective to be scouting for birds. Yeah, no, I, I actually agree with your timing. I might, you know, and you nailed it with your, you know, comment of, you know, if you have the snow. Um, that's one thing that I think people – I got a lot. Oh, hold on, I've got a lot of things going rattling in my brain here, real quick. So 
get me back on track if I if I don't circle back. But one thing is that I think people need to understand that are listening to this if they if they live back east or if they're in the Midwest or whatever and they want to come west and chase Merriams or you know they want to chase some mountain birds, our birds. If whether it's you know Rio Grands, I I talk all the time about the movement that Rio Grands do. They flock up huge flocks, winter flocks, and they will move long distances up and down their habitat corridors, uh, and that's just a, a behavioral trait that Rios have. Merriams are very similar in the fact that because of the deep snow, and a lot of times because of the way the food limitations are, they will flock up as well. They might not flock up as big and as dense as Rios will, but they'll flock up and they will definitely spend time on designated winter ranges. And so they will move across the landscape, very similar to how deer and elk move across the landscape in the spring by following that snow line. And I think yeah, to take one step back, I will say from a habitat standpoint, if you want to come out and chase birds, realistically for me, I'm focusing on two primary habitats. Ponderosa pine forests, number one. And then number two, if you can have a ponderosa pine slash oak brush habitat. Most, 99% of the time, if you're going to find western birds like in New Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, um, you correct me, Jay, on the Goulds, because I don't know about the trees down there and the, and the food sources down in Mexico. But for the Colorado, well, even let's just even go from western Nebraska and eastern Wyoming up in the Black Hills and that type of area where you can chase Merriams. Montana and, and Montana might be a little bit different, but if you're chasing Merriams from Wyoming down to Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona. In my Utah, well, Utah too. <clears throat> for me, it's it's ponderosa pines, ponderosa pines, ponderosa pines. Because a they've got great roosting uh, ability, but because of the pine nuts, the pine seeds that the the ponderosas produce, that is by far one of the best winter range and the you know, winter foods that they'll have. And if you're in southern Colorado and, and New Mexico in that area that has oak brush, or even, yeah, I mean it's 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 phenomenal. So. I'm going to focus there, but yes, Jay is right. They they will follow that snow line hard in the year. Why, why Chris? Why well, tell people why they're following the snow line uh, for for spring green up? If you, and I talk about this on the turkey module all the time. It doesn't matter if you're talking about Easterns, Rio Grandes, Merriams, when they are transitioning from the winter range in the winter, and they're going to start going into spring. That they a they want to re recover their body condition if they need to if they, if the food has been limiting they're not going to have a lot of fat reserves and so they're going to try to find the most nutritious food that they possibly can but by the same token they're going to be trying to find the stuff that has the highest protein potential and highest digestibility potential because they need to pack on calories because they have to the hens I mean specifically the hens they've got to reclaim their body condition and then be able to have enough to start producing eggs. And so a lot of times the nuts and seeds that they use heavily, whether it's grass seeds to pine seeds to acorns or whatever they would use in the winter, those might have a lot of carbohydrates to them and fat, but they don't necessarily have a lot of protein in them. Eggs require a lot of protein. So the new grasses that are greening up and the, you know, the broadleaf annuals, the weedy species, the, what people call the grasses and the forbs, those are all that spring green up. That's all high protein potential. And so they're going to follow that and they're going to hit it hard just to try to get that protein intake as high as possible. And typically speaking, as the snow melts and recedes, that's usually be, means because the temperatures are rising, getting warmer you got warmer soil moisture. You've got that snow line where you have a lot of soil moisture because the snow is melting. You get the best green up. And so they'll just follow that snow line up the side of the mountain. And again, when you have snow, 
Yeah, I mean, I think uh, some years are better than others, and then some states there's always snow, and I think those birds have to actually migrate out of the high country, you know, down into the lower uh, transitional country, and then as the spring uh, starts to thaw, obviously the snow starts to melt, and they're going to follow that snow line up, and then a lot of those birds will be found at very high elevations, but... Yeah. There's certainly birds that, you know, they'll have to travel off a mountain because, you know, there's not enough food up there. And they know that, uh, well, the question is, do you think they really know that, yeah, the snow can get too deep and we, we better stay, you know, we better stay down here? Because I think there's been instances where birds have followed, you know, the, the, the snow line up and then have a big late spring storm and, you know, two and a half, three feet of snow. And all of a sudden they have a, you know, they have a a late winter die off because they got trapped. And so I think they learn to, uh, you know, stay low and, and not go high until, you know, they know it's time to go ahead and move on up. Well, and I will agree with that. And, and I know that those birds will learn where those pockets are that they can hole up in. For instance, there's one place in Northern Colorado I used to hunt, killed a number of, of really nice Merriams up there. That population I was, I, when spring season came around, I was hunting between 9,000 and 10,000 feet. And literally, I was on the fringe edge of where there were remnant pockets of um, ponderosa pine. But a lot of the habitat was starting to transition from ponderosa pine into aspen and then even into spruce fir. You know, basically the, the Engelman spruce and some of the juniper, or, or, uh, yeah, I mean, white pine and, and or white fir and Engelman spruce. So, I mean, high elevation stuff. But the birds were up there because of those pockets of, of ponderosa pine. However, the bulk of the winter, they literally were 10 to 15 miles away down the mountain. They would follow the, the kind of the creek corridors and the little drainage corridors that went from high, you know, high to low. But they would be down 10, 15 miles away, way down low on the winter range and then as things started to warm up and things started to green up they would they would move and sometimes i've killed number of birds up there literally in a foot or 18 inches of snow they're up there because they got caught but there was a couple little pockets they knew of where that they could get in and, and, and get some good food but yeah you know when talking about how to scout for turkeys i'm going to tell guys that you know if they're going to a new state or they're going to a new area within a state. Um, you know, I like to try and talk to as many game and fish guys, maybe for that unit, uh, biologists for that unit, uh, guys that work for the Forest Service or the BLM. I like to talk to locals. I like to talk to ranchers. Basically get a bead, get a, you know, get some maps and get a bead from people that have been in the area and try and get as much local knowledge as you can as to where people see the birds, uh, wh where people are camping, where uh, the most pressure is in a unit, um, where, you know, uh, you know, basically bird sightings and bird experiences. And you, t you may talk to someone that's a, you know, that's a logger that's not even a turkey hunter, and he's like, oh, yeah, I see him, you know, this, you know, beginning of April, I see him here. Uh, you know, middle of May, I see them here and, and try and ask them as many detailed questions about where, you know, good locations are. Other things I'm asking are, you know, where are areas that are, you know, kind of walk in only type stuff where maybe if you're hunting, you know, public ground, big tracts of public ground, maybe where are some areas where there are birds, but where can I also get away from people and, and you know, have an enjoyable hunt where I'm not, you know, standing on top of other hunters. Um, I think that's important. And then as you transition that into, uh, you know, your main goal of scouting, you're identifying, you know, the feeding, the strutting and the roosting areas of those birds. So you're talking to people trying to gather information about where birds are within the unit, good different areas to try. Then specifically, are there specific spots that you should try? And then once you get in the field, identifying those areas where, you know, they're feeding, strutting, roosting, you're, you're looking for turkey sign, uh, tracks, dropping, scratches, and strut marks. And, you know, in my mind, first and foremost, hearing birds, seeing birds, 
and looking for tracks is huge. And I was wondering if you could speak to that, Chris. Well, yeah. Let me let me just kind of step back just one real quick point and to re or not re but just bolster what you just said about talking with folks um, that are that are either local or at least regional experts, whether that's the biologists or forest service guys or whatever, because like I said, you know, that one area up in Northern Colorado where I've hunted, those birds move a lot and they are literally just constantly treading that snow line going up the mountain. So they might winter at 6,000 feet, five to 6,000 feet, but then by April and especially in May, they're literally flirting with 10,000 feet. However, if I go down to southern Colorado on the New Me- or in northern New Mexico, the way the terrain is and the way the mountains are, well, heck, even outside of Colorado Springs in, in the Rampart Range, that's a, one of the most popular t- hunting areas for turkeys. It just gets pounded by people. But the way the mountains are, there really is no significant elevation change that the birds can capitalize on. And so in that case, what ends up happening is they just – there are certain pockets in the the mountains that offer them the best winter habitat. And so if if you go and you say, okay, well, I heard Chris say that the Merriams move long distances and they go from winter range to summer range. Well, yeah, but it depends on where you're going. So you have to definitely talk with the area biologists, game wardens, uh, ranchers, just like you said, talk to the local folks because they're going to have the best information about how those particular birds utilize the landscape. And then the other thing, too, that I would kind of catapult on from what you just said about talking to them, pay attention when they say, oh, yeah, I see birds here all the time. Okay, when? And what activity are they doing? I've talked to a number of people that are hikers and, and they just like to, to camp and go out on weekend excursions and that type of stuff. And they're like, oh, man, I saw turkeys up here all the time, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay. When were you up there? Oh, I was up there in June. Okay. So that tells me the turkeys are up there in June. All right. Well, does that mean that they're going to be there in April or at the end of March? Mm, not necessarily. So pay attention to when those people are in the area, because we've got some people that, you know, ride dirt bikes or four wheelers or whatever, and they're up there as soon as the Forest Service opens up the area for motorized recreation. And so a lot of times they're up there at the end of April or beginning of May, and that's when they say, well, I see turkeys then. All right, now that's a little bit better because we're a little bit earlier. So definitely talk to the locals, but pay attention to when they're also seeing those birds. Yeah, I think that's huge because it also places, you know, if they're saying, oh, I see turkeys all the time. Well, how many do you see? Oh, I see 40, 50 in a bunch. Yeah. Right then I'm going, well, okay, wait a minute. Yeah. Sounds like winter flock to me. Yeah. But if they say, oh, no, I see them all the time, big toms, you know, just, just, or, or usually they'll say, you know, the big ones, the big ones. Now, what do you mean the big ones? Well, you know, they're all puffed out. Yeah. And I say, well, like, is it a fan? Do they have... Yeah, I see that a lot. Well, right then I go, okay, this person is actually seeing yeah. toms, you know, male turkeys displaying, yes. you know, their big tail fan, which tells me, okay, springtime, most, you know, the, yeah, you can have toms strutting all all the times of year, but primarily they're going to be strutting in in the spring when we're, you're trying to hunt them. Yep. And you know, you talk to a hiker that's like, yeah, along the such and such trail, and I see those big ones all the time. They're all fanned out. Well, right then I go, well, how, you know, how many in your hike? Well, we hike about four and a half miles and I may see, you know, four or five of those big ones strutted out or, you know, fanned out. They don't know what they're seeing. They just know they see a big puff ball of turkey. Yeah. So that might be a place that I go, okay, I'm going to go check this place out because there's obviously birds during that time of year doing their thing. Well, and, and to kind of joke about that, you know, if, if I talk to a hiker, and they said, well, I went on a four or five mile hike and I saw, you know, four, you know, I saw four or five of those big guys puffed out. I'll tell you right now, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to descend upon that place. Because that means there's a pile of birds. If someone saw that, that many birds, that's the other thing people need to realize is depending on the habitat, 
you know, you some mountain areas are not that productive. They have birds. There's birds there. But you literally might be dealing with a tiny isolated flock here or an isolated flock there, just just a handful. And so sometimes you've got to be looking at, you know, kind of like a needle in a haystack. Whereas, you know, I can go down to southern Colorado or, you know, you know anywhere along that southern Colorado border, really. Um, I mean, the population is just crazy. It fluctuates year after year, but the food is such and the, and the winter severity is, is not as bad to where there's actually a sizable population. But when I went and hunted northern Colorado, goodness gracious, if I, if I found one or two got, well, let, let me just say that I would go up there and literally some years I would find one gobbler. That's it. He'd have, it would be one gobbler and a handful of hens. And literally, I would not shoot him. I'd just go up there, call him in, and my rule, and I took a couple of my buddies up there, and our rules were, if there are multiple toms gobbling, then yes, we will take one or two. But if we get up there and there's only one bird, we walk away. Because, yeah, I mean, I just, it just, it was, there's some years where the, the winter, had, winter severity was so bad, or the birds just hadn't gotten there yet that, you know, you shoot one gobbler, you you just shot the gobbler that's in there. Right. And yeah, I think we owe it to the future, you know, to the future generations and for the following years to not shoot if there's only one breeding Tom in there and let him let him do his thing. Let's take a quick break here. Since 1982, the Outdoorsman's in Phoenix has made it their goal to provide the very best customer service combined with the latest and greatest optics and accessories in the business. Outdoorsman's is the leading designer and manufacturer of high quality tripods and mounting accessories for any hunter's optical needs. Go to Outdoorsmans.com or call 1-800-291-8065 and use the J. Scott promo code to receive 10% off all Outdoorsman's packs and pack accessories. Okay, Chris, let's talk about, and we've talked about it a little bit, but let's talk about where to scout for turkeys. One of the things that I like to do is I like to walk on two track roads and especially on ridge lines. Um, and what I find down here in Arizona is that if you can get on those nice ridge lines and walk those roads, you can, one, if you cover, say, a mile or two, you know, in, in distance, you can look for a lot of tracks. And for whatever reason, those ridge lines, they're crossing back and forth. It's a great area to strut because usually on those ridge lines, you know, there's some open areas. So as I'm walking those two track roads, I'm obviously looking for sign, I'm listening for sign, and I'm looking for scratchings, I'm looking for feeding areas. Um, other places where I like to scout for turkeys is I like to check the water sources. Uh, in, in places like Arizona and New Mexico and some places where it's a little more arid and there's not live water, meaning you know creeks or running water, where there's just uh, tanks. Uh, I like to go check all around the tanks and just check for sign and tracks. And I'm looking for areas that have, you know, quite a bit of track around the water's edges, uh, looking for strut marks on the berms of those tanks. And then conversely, I like to also look for areas on a map that are going to have a creek or some sort of live water, because it seems like in my experience, the more water that you find, uh, the more birds you'll find. And sometimes it's a little bit difficult if you have, you know, a, a live water to kind of isolate where the birds are. But canyons that have live water, typically you can be up on high points and listening in those drainages and you're going to hear birds um, gobbling in the morning and the evening, you know, at roost time and you'll be able to kind of pinpoint them. Yeah, I know. I agree wholeheartedly with that. I mean, everything you just said, Absolutely. The one caveat I will say that people need to pay attention to, you know, Arizona, when Jay's talking about down in Arizona and some of the southern regions where you're talking about stock tanks or stock ponds is basically impoundment, water impoundments. A lot of times you're going to have that soft soil around the water's edge and it's going to, it's awesome for finding tracks, which is, which is great. And I talk all the time about when we're scouting for Rio Grande turkeys, I'm walking the river banks and, and the sandy corridors of the river bottoms. Because same thing, you can find tracks in the sand beautifully. Um, but 
when we're talking about some of these mountain birds and live water, I agree with you. I think any water is good. They need to have some sort of water. Live water can even be better. However, in some of the mountainous terrain, keep this in mind, the water is going to be coming down that mountain and it's going to be carving through a lot of times uh, some crushed granite or gravel and rock and stuff to where you don't have good soft soil necessarily around the banks or on the, the, those little creek drainages. So find the water. But just because you're not finding tracks next to the water's edge, don't it doesn't mean that birds aren't using it. That's where I'm going to kind of take a step back and say, okay, I'm going to start looking for droppings and, and scratchings and everything else. But the one thing that I've kind of found across the board throughout the years, and it doesn't matter if it's we're talking Wyoming or we're talking about Colorado, New Mexico, not all live water is necessarily created equal. If they only, if the birds in this area only have one or two options of water, then they're going to use it. However, if you're in a situation, and especially if we're talking about the mountains that have snow and we're dealing with snow runoff, you might have water everywhere only because and these little trickles coming down the mountain because of the snow melt. They'll use all of that water. However, pay attention to the differences between each of those water sources across the landscape. And I used to talk about this all the time in my seminars. You might see, okay, that drainage has water, that one does, that one does, that one does, that one does, but this one over here has tall grass in the bottom. It has willows in the bottom. It has other dis, you know, deciduous trees, the trees that leave, you know, lose their leaves in the wintertime. If you, you know, maybe there's aspens growing in and associated with it. If you look at a water source or a little creek drainage or a water source and you have other different types of plants growing in that, especially plants like willows and grasses and aspens and stuff that want more soil moisture than everything else growing around, well, that's going to tell me, number one, the water in that drainage is consistent. Otherwise, those plants wouldn't be growing there. Maybe this this little trickle coming off the mountain that has water in it now, maybe it has water in it now, but give me a week or two, and it very well might be dried up. Whereas this one that has the aspens and willows and, and grasses and stuff in it, well, those wouldn't be growing there unless that water stayed there and stayed there consistently and consistently through at least the, the bulk of the year. So, yes, I want to see where all the water is, but I'm going to really focus on those water drainages that have a different, you know, other habitat components to it. Because not only is that water going to be there, which means as the season progresses, it's going to keep the water and those birds might use that area more often and more consistently. But it's probably also going to have the better forage associated. It's going to have better grasses up the slopes, it's, uh, you know, up the mountain, which means it's probably, if I was gambling, I'm going to probably find those birds in and around those particular drainages more than I'm going to find them in these periphery areas. I think that's great. So what I hear you saying is predominant canyons that have water all year round, when you're hunting areas that are covered in water, you might find more birds in those drainages that have consistent water all the time because they've gotten used to that canyon always has water, dry years, wet years. And, and if your, your, your country that you're hunting is covered in water, hunt the, the, the predominant canyons that have the most water and you'll probably find more birds. Yeah, and especially as the season progresses. Because, again, keep in mind, what we're talking about right now is scouting for, you know, well, realistically – to be honest, we're actually kind of doing preseason scouting because, like you said, most of the seasons are going to be opening up sometime in that middle of the April time frame. And here we are talking about end of March and beginning of April going out and scouting. Well, again, those birds are going to be transitioning off of their winter range, transitioning off of winter food. They might have had plenty of winter food over on this side of the mountain where we have these little trickles and rivulets of, of water because of snow melt. But again, they're going to be transitioning to the best spring green up because that's where they're going to, the hens are going to want to nest. That canyon over there that might even be a half a mile or even a mile away, 
is the spot that has the most consistent green up, has the best nesting success or nesting opportunities around it. Yeah, those birds might be over here on, on this one end of the mountain, but they are going to be transitioning over this way. So if I want to know where they are now, but I also want to know where they are likely going to, because I might be out there, you know, opening weekend. If it doesn't happen, I don't fill my tag. I might want to go out the next weekend or the weekend after that, which now puts me at the end of April. Well, Jeep, you know, by the time the end of April comes, we're probably losing most of our snow to where now those birds are going to have moved. They're going to have transitioned to somewhere else. Well, where is that somewhere else? Most of the time, it's going to be where you have the best diversity of habitat, which is oftentimes associated where you have more consistent water. Let's talk specifically about tracks. And, um, you know, there may be some people listening that really don't know what a turkey track is um, or looks like. And I want to talk a little bit about the freshness of tracks and how do people determine whether the turkeys are have been there or are there right now. And the one thing I would say is you make a good point about soft soil. And one of the reasons I like to walk on ridge lines and quite honestly, two track roads is because a lot of times a two track will have a little bit of soft dirt uh, not in all terrains, but we'll have areas maybe on the side of a two-track or areas that are a low spot in a two-track road where you're going to catch those those prints, those those tracks of turkeys. And I'm looking for hen tracks and I'm looking for gobbler tracks. Now, how do you tell a hen track from a gobbler track? I'm going to say that the gobbler track, the 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 middle toe is going to be much longer, much bigger. It's, it's predominantly a bigger track. And the way to tell if the turkeys, uh, if it's a fresh track, if it's in the mud and it's dried, you kind of can get down there and see how dry it is. Or if, if you have any type of like dust or kind of, you know, just light dirt that's been undisturbed and you just see a, 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 a faint print on there, more than likely that faint print is going to be a fresh track. And if you have dusty areas and you see a track and, and you can see the actual like rivets, you can actually see the indentions of where the part of their toe has on the, on the bottom end. It's what would the word be corrugated. It's not flat. It's kind of got dimples in it. You can see those different uh, uh, contours of the track. Essentially if fingerprints. Can, fingerprints. If you can actually see, good word, yeah, fingerprint then you know that that's probably a, a pretty smoke and fresh track because in those dusty areas, if you have any wind at all, it's going to blow that track out. But if you see real fresh, defined detail, you probably have a, you know, a track that was left that day. Yeah, and the other thing too is, again, if we're talking about roads, depending on the road and depending on the traffic vehicle, People, vehicle, bikes, jeeps, cars, you know, trucks, vehicle traffic. Depending on the, the amount of vehicle traffic going down that road, that is also going to end up throwing either dust or debris or whatever in those tracks. And if we're talking about using roads to scout, which I do, I, I, it's a great way to cover a lot of country very quickly and get an idea of, of what you know, some of the use is in, around, around the area. I really do like seeing the tracks on the side of the road, but then I'm absolutely going to follow those tracks as best as I can. I'm going to see when and where they cross the travel lane where the, the tire tracks, the vehicle tire, tire tracks are. If you have a, a turkey track clearly identifiable in a dusty tire track, well, obviously that bird went over that tire track after the uh, person has been there. So if you have consistent turkey tracks on top of vehicle tracks, that means most of the time you've got a good consistent use of birds there because if the, car, if the cars are constantly going back and forth, even if it's one a day, but yet you consistently have tra turkey tracks over top of them, you've got a lot of activity there. Whereas if you get a rainstorm, and this, this kind of moves away from the dusty prints, but if you get a rainstorm or, or you, you have a turkey that leaves a, a print in some sort of moist soil environment, shoot, 
those those tracks can persist for a while, and sometimes it gets you excited. You're like, oh my gosh, there's a turkey track. Well, yeah, it's you know, ten days old because it was in a, a little wet depression. You can still look at the definition sure, though, absolutely. and look for that fingerprint, like you said, and look for the, the contours. And you'll be able to tell if around where where the low part of the track is like down into the mud, if if that raised part of the mud is actually start to crackle and dry, you know, it's it's probably getting older. But if you know, if you see a track in the mud and it's all wet around it, I'm gonna say that turkey's probably been there within the last hour or two. Yeah. Um that that's a good good sign. Let's talk about droppings. Oops, hold on. Go ahead. Don't, let's, let's not jump away from tracks just yet because the other thing that I focus on heavily, and especially for folks like you and, and other people that love to sit behind glass and sit behind their binoculars and, and, and look, I love looking for tracks in snow because those birds are, you know, just by the nature of terrain in the mountains, you'll have some south-facing or west-facing slopes and hillsides, but then you'll have some north or east-facing slopes and hillsides. And you might have snow piled or drifted in underneath these trees over here, but yet on this type side of the mountain, it's all just open and, and melted off. Well, those birds are going to be using all of those habitat components. And so you're going to have birds crisscrossing over snow. If you have I'm going to, you know, it, for me, looking at the freshness of a track in snow, w one thing I'm going to sit there and say, okay, is it warm during the day? If it's warm during the day and is, and is this snow receiving sunlight? Because if this area is getting hit by, you know, sunlight, if I put a divot in the snow or if I put a track in the snow, a lot of times if the sun's shining on it, by me packing the snow down there or disturbing it a little bit, all of a sudden – it warms up a lot quicker than the surrounding snow and it'll melt off fast. And then conversely, if it's been cold or if it's shady uh, and, and the snow is light and fluffy, well, it might stay light and fluffy for a little bit before it starts to melt. So I'm going to take a look at what aspect that mountainside is on and what the snow is doing. But you can definitely look across the landscape and see, okay, there's turkey tracks going through the snow. Well, if it's in the snow and it's all melted out and it's basically a, you know, you just have that, that general idea that you got the three toes out front and one small on the back and it's clearly a turkey track, but it's bare dirt underneath it. That's an older track because the sun has thawed out that area and it's just kind of melted everything around it. However, sometimes if you are out there scouting, you'll come across a turkey track in, you know, wet, packy snow that literally still has the exact characteristics that Jay is talking about in the dust. I mean, you'll literally see, you know, some of the indentations and some of the quote unquote fingerprints, if you will, in that snow. I mean, it's clear as day. You know, you are on a fresh track. Same thing in powdery snow. If you're going through sometimes powdery snow, you actually may not actually see the three toes clearly. What you end up seeing is a divot an impression in the snow, and then when they step out, this kind of the snow falls back down inside it. If the snow that fell down inside it is still light and fluffy, it's probably a pretty fresh track. However, if it's a little divot and the snow is kind of falling in and, it, and it's kind of melted and it's it's kind of created a little cave or, or a little uh, uh, little pocket or crater, then it's probably an older track that's starting to melt out a little bit. But Finding tracks in the snow is one of the best ways to figure out where those birds, if you don't have, A, if you don't have roads in your area, or B, you know, you met, you know, Jay, you mentioned it here a little bit ago about finding those areas that are away from people or, you know, getting away from the, the bulk of, of where everybody else is. Well, a lot of times you got to get away from some of those roads. And so following, in the mountains anyway, when we're dealing with those habitats that don't lend themselves well to leaving tracks on that crushed granite and the rock, Man, finding tracks in the snow is, is the way to go. And literally, you could be on one side of the mountain, sit, literally sit with a pair of binoculars and a spotting scope, just like you'd be glassing for, you know, shed antlers or coos deer or whatever. You just start picking apart that other side, and you're like, bink, those look like tracks. Okay, fine. Make a mark, make an uh, annotation, keep on glassing, keep on looking. Oh, there it looks like tracks, too. Now, the other thing, too, sorry, I don't mean to keep rambling, but. Um, no, it's good. 
The other thing, too, to keep in mind is what type of track am I looking at? Now, Jay's talking about the difference between gobbler tracks and hen tracks. One thing I've always told people is if you're a shotgun hunter, you kind of know what your three-inch shotgun shell looks like. Even if you even if you have a two- and three-quarter-inch shotgun, you know what a shotgun shell looks like. Oftentimes, that gobbler track is going to have a three-inch middle toe. If If that track, the middle toe, if you have a clear impression – where you can see the center heel pad, it's going to look like a round little kind of disc, and then you can have you can also see the toenail impression at the end of that track. If that's about three inches plus or minus, then it's probably a gobbler track. If it's two and a half inches or maybe even a little less, that's probably a hen track. Now, granted, some of the Mount Merriams, the, man, you can have some gigantic hens. But still, even though you can have a big honking hen, her track is still going to be you know, less than three inches. And I would say that the middle toe predominantly on a gobbler is always long, bigger, whereas a hen, the three toes are kind of much the same. Sure. Yes, sure. their middle toe is a little longer, but a gobbler is going to be, you know, a big middle toe is usually a real good indication of a gobbler. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And then... For me, when I'm looking for tracks in the snow, and it, well, tracks in the snow or tracks on the road, doesn't matter. If I'm looking for tracks, I really do try to pay attention to what type of track I'm finding. Am I finding a single bird that's a large track, meaning it's a single gobbler, and he's headed across the landscape? Or did I find that big honking gobbler track or two but wait a minute, it looks like, wait a minute, I've got some smaller tracks in here as well. And keep in mind, they, they don't necessarily have to be on top of one another. I might find a gobbler track, say, over here, and then 30 yards away, here's a couple hen tracks, and then another 30 yards away from that, wait, that's more hen tracks. Are they going the same direction, or are they going back and forth in circles and around and around? If I'm finding multiple hen tracks and multiple gobbler tracks if they're all just kind of they're all pointed in, in all sorts of different directions then it's hard for me to tell how many birds there are maybe the, the maybe there's a half a dozen birds but they just spent two hours in this area and they were just running all over the place versus maybe there's a half a dozen turkeys but they're all going from this ridge over to that ridge and so all the tracks are going the same direction well if they're all going the same direction now i can start counting I'm dealing with four hens, I'm dealing with five hens, I'm dealing with six hens or whatever, and I've got two gobblers. It gives me an indication of what type of activities in that area. And then the other thing, too, is if I see those tracks going from one area to somewhere else, I will backtrack them, no pun intended, to find out, you know, are they leaving one area and making a mic, you know, are they moving to a better area, or is this just part of their daily, you know, are they just doing a, a kind of a, a, a round robin cyclic pattern around this ridge line because if i can find that they're just making a big loop well then i know that they're staying in this area for a little bit but if i just find a single gobbler track man sometimes those can get your hopes way high and just leave you crushed later because that bird literally may be headed out and and i've followed them more than a mile across the mountainside and it was just a single lone gobbler that was just he was just striking out and he's like I'm going and I'm going to figure out where everybody is and he was just on a hike. Yeah, uh, let's take a quick break here and then I got something to add to that. Utah Hydrographics is in the water transfer printing service and they are open to whatever you can dream up. Choose from a wide range of camel patterns, designs, and colors. Whether it's guns, bows, tools, rifle stocks, vehicles, steering wheels, fenders, dashboards, paint guns, fishing rods, cups, tripods, watches, knife grips, helmets for a local sports team or for your motorcycle, picture frames, mailbox, animal skulls, you name it, they can probably do it. Utah Hydrographics loves taking things that are general looking and turns them into something that looks fantastic and eye-popping. Give them a call and see what they can do for you and receive up to a 10% discount by using the J. Scott 16 promo code. Visit them at utahhydrographics.com or on Instagram at utahhydrographics. Whether you are interested in elk, deer, 
antelope, bighorn sheep, or moose, Western Hunter and Elk Hunter magazines will bring the adventure to your mailbox. These publications feature articles on the finest hunting gear, tips and tactics from experienced hunters, field judging trophies, glassing techniques, calling strategies, and much more. To become a more knowledgeable and skilled hunter, subscribe today. Go to westernhunter.net forward slash jscott and enter your email address for a chance to win a $1,500 credit towards any Swarovski product. One thing that I heard you say that struck a chord with me was direction. And I'm always making a mental note of what direction are the tracks going. If I'm walking a, a ridge line and within, say, a mile, two mile stretch, I find a bunch of tracks. And it seems that every track is going from right to left, like every, you know, for yep. the whole walk, all the tracks are going right to left yep. and they look fairly old. What I'm going to think in my mind is, OK, this is probably winter flock birds coming from one direction, headed another. What I like to see in that mile long stretch is I like to see tracks going both ways. Agreed. And when you see tracks that are going left, going right coming here, coming there, going down the road, going back up the road, that tells me that they're using that uh, ridge line or corridor, whether it have a two-track road on it or not, they're using that area to go back and forth, whether it be go from roost to feeding or what have you. I love seeing a place where there's tracks literally going every direction because that gives me a higher, you know, percentage wise they're going to be spending more time there because they're going back and forth and those are areas that I may define as good areas to go try and you know uh, run and gun and just try and strike a bird by walking you know slowly down those ridge lines and glassing and I've done my scouting and and even as I'm hunting I'm constantly looking at the ground looking at the track seeing what those birds are doing and it, you know, also if I see birds going pretty much tracks, let's say going down the road or, or primarily going one direction, I then also might say, well, maybe it's dry and maybe there's a water source nearby and maybe those turkeys are coming to that water. And then once they get to that water, then they leave and go out a different direction. So I'm, I'm, Constantly as I'm scouting and as I'm hunting, I'm constantly making mental notes of what I'm seeing on the ground with, with you know, the tracks, the scratches, uh, the strut marks, um, you know, etc. Trying to, you know, analyze every little detail of what those birds have been doing to try and tell myself what those birds will be doing. Yep, I agree wholeheartedly. Okay, um, speaking about droppings, uh, I'd like to add that droppings, gobbler droppings typically are going to be a bit bigger and they're going to be kind of a uh, long kind of cylinder shaped, maybe like, you know, an inch, inch, inch and a half long. And a lot of times they have a, like a little J. So they're kind of shaped like a J kind of like a hook. Um, and then the hen droppings a lot of times are going to be, in my mind, a little bit smaller, but they're going to be more of like a little pile. And I was wondering if you could address that, Chris. Well, absolutely. I mean, in gobbler droppings, whether you're talking eastern wild turkeys in Vermont versus Gould's turkeys in Mexico, biology is biology. So droppings are going to be very consistent across the board. So if you know what droppings look like from your eastern wild turkeys, you know what Merriam droppings look like. You know, a lot of people will talk about the fact that a hen dropping kind of looks like, a, you know, a giant or a piece of popped popcorn or, you know, some ice cream scoops. You know, that's more rounded and more clumped and, and just like little, yeah, like a piece of popped popcorn. Whereas, and that's just because of the way their biology is, their rear end is, and when the poop comes out, and then a gobbler, yes, a lot of times it's going to be longer. It's, it's oftentimes can be J-shaped, uh, and then you can definitely tell the size of the bird by the size of the poop. 
Um, a lot of times you're going to have them. They're going to be probably about the size, you know, as big around as your your pinky finger, but it can they can get fairly sizable too if you get a, a big gobbler. One thing that I will say, um, just as a an aside, for those people that are scouting for Merriams in and around some of these mountain communities where you have bodies of water like a lake or a pond, even if it's a big creek or a river. If you're down next to the river or down next to the water and you're looking for turkey tracks and droppings and stuff, if there are Canada geese around, make sure you're not confusing turkey droppings with goose droppings. A lot of times goose droppings, can they can be either shape. You know, sometimes, though, they're going to be long and, and you know, more long tubular droppings. However, Oftentimes, just because of the nature of the food that turkeys eat, the, the food that turkeys eat is oftentimes a little bit different than what Canada geese eat. So a lot of times Canada goose poop is going to be more runny and very, very green. Slimy, yep. kind of. Versus turkeys are going to have maybe, it, it might be green, but there's probably going to be some brown, and it's going to be a little drier. It's going to be a little more solid, typically because of the nature of the food that they're eating is just gen- going to be generally a little bit drier. So that's great stuff. Um, I want to talk about um, strut marks and um, I'm going to actually try and put a few photos of all this different stuff up on my website that will coincide with these episodes so that guys can see turkey tracks and droppings and strut marks and scratches and all that kind of stuff. So For those of you that are listening, you can go to uh, my website, jscottoutdoors.com, and I'll make sure to have some photos of this. Um, I want to talk about strut marks, and I think one of the cool things about strut marks is... Hey, wait. Yep. Can we hold off on that real quick? Yeah. Because I got a question from somebody the other day, and I think it's probably important to touch on here. Yep. One of the things that people... When people are saying, I want to find a roost site, a lot of times what people will say is, I want to find a roost site, and I'm going to find a roost site by looking for droppings. And they want to focus on trying to find those areas where there's a lot of droppings. Now, it's important to know what a turkey dropping looks like. And yes, if you get into an area that's underneath trees or whatever, and it's got a lot of droppings around it, yeah, it might be a roost site. But don't be discouraged if you don't find concentrated areas of poop, all right, because depending on the food that the turkeys are eating and depending on the trees that they're roosting in, you can sometimes have that those turkey droppings fall apart very easily. And so if the turkeys are roosting up in these big honking ponderosa pines, they're going to be towards the top of the pine tree. If there's a lot of branches underneath of them and the the food that they're eating and the, which leads to the poop that they're dropping is very delicate. It's not really hard and dense. They might poop. That poop falls from the tree, hits a couple branches and just shatters and breaks up to where on the forest floor underneath these big trees, you might not find a lot of clear indication that, Oh, this is a designated roost site. There's, there's a lot of droppings under here. All right. So keep that in mind as people are out there looking for droppings. Some people say, well, I, there, there can't be turkeys around here because I'm not finding any turkey droppings. Well, okay, that might be the case, but keep in mind that depending on what they're eating and, and how they're moving across the landscape, they may or may not have really robust poops that hold together over time. So I just wanted to make sure, just wanted to... No, and I think, that's a, I think that's a great point, and I think we'll talk about some of that even more when we talk about roosting. Perfect. Okay. But I think, I think another thing to point out is that if, you, if you're looking, in my opinion, for Merriams, if you're looking for roost trees that have, you know, and I've seen them where they have the white droppings all around the tree, you're, that's pretty much how they are when they're winter flocked up. And in my mind, when they're winter flocked, yes, they're going to primarily roost in a lot of the same trees. But as the spring progresses, in my opinion, in the mountains, Chase and Merriam's, their their roost trees become way less predictable. So as you're scouting, you may find some of those big predominant winter flock roosting areas that you do find a lot of the droppings. 
But don't count on the fact that, you know, a couple weeks, three weeks later when the season starts, and as you said, as the season progresses, you know, through most of April, through most of May in, in a lot of states, they may never come back to that tree again. That might have been where they roosted all winter yep. when there was, you know, 40, 50, 30, 40, 50 turkeys together. Um, but that's, you know, where you find, and, and that's one of the things when I tell people when they ask, you know, when should I start scouting? Well, I say whenever you can. But you have to keep in mind that where you're finding them in February and in March is going to be a totally different place like what you talked about in April and May. Yep. It may be the same, but it very possibly could be different um, because those you know, flocks are breaking up and you know, they've got a pecking order and all the different things that go on. And the sole fact that they're moving to, most of the time, higher ground for you know, the summer. They like to spend the summers in the, you know, coolest places they can. Now, people will email and say, oh, well, I got birds down low and, you know, they don't all move up. And that's absolutely true. Um, but a lot of the birds in the western states do like higher elevations. So I, I think that's a great point that you make, um, Chris. Yeah, I just, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I just wanted to touch on that because, yeah, it just, I know people all the time are asking me, well, how do I find a roost site? And it's like, well, and and they always focus around the droppings. I'm like, well, you can, however, with a caveat. So, yeah. Before we get to strut marks, I'd actually like to touch on scratches. And okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll have some pictures of some scratches on my website as well. Um, you know, scratches are undeniable, and you can find areas when you're scouting, and it will be where the the, the ponderosa pine needles are pulled up. And it looks like literally you you got down on your hands and knees with one hand and kind of just pawed you know towards yourself where you'll have about a basketball size area where you'll see the fresh dirt and then on one side let's say you're pulling it you know the turkey's pulling it towards them which is what they do they pull the leaves towards them and then with their mouth or their beak then they you know they peck out the grubs or whatever they're finding down there in the soil or the nuts and the things that I look for on uh, scratches, scratches, you'll find areas where there's tons of scratches and they look old or they don't look fresh. And I think that's a great indication where if you had a, you know, January, February turkey tag, which they don't offer them. But if you were going to try and photograph or film or, or you know, even hunt turkeys, if they would allow you, that would be a great place to hunt them because you see you know, huge areas where there's, you know, 40 or 50 or 60 of these scratch marks, that's where that whole flock is just sitting there and scratching and they're all over and you walk and, you know, you're on those hillsides and it's just scratchings. That's a little bit deceiving like we talked about before because that's winter flocked areas. So don't be deceived uh, when you see those and you've got to look at the freshness of them. Now, if, if, if you're moving into mid-April and you see scratches, Go over and look at them. A lot of times, those same things we were talking about with the tracks, you can actually see the freshness of, of the, the pine needles, and you can see in the actual soil, you can see does it look like like the cold mornings where it's frosted over, and you know the the, the actual um, toe print in the dirt. Do they look like you know? Does it look hard? Does it look crusty? Or does it look fresh? Like um, if, if you were to just do it that morning, and sometimes I'll even pull back pine needles right next to it and kind of look at the soil and compare the color of the soil. Yep. A lot of times if the soil is darker, in my mind, if it's darker, then, then that means it's pretty fresh. If it's lighter, that means that the sun and the temperature and the, you know, the, the, the frost of the mornings have have kind of crusted it and made it kind of a lighter color. Um, you got any thoughts on that, Chris? No, you're you're abs you just nailed it. Most of the time, it's you know the differences. The reason why you can tell a difference between an old, you know, dished out, scratched out area and a fresh one is because of the of the color. And a lot of times that color is different because of soil moisture. If if the pine needles next to it look like the same color that are in that are around that dished out area. And the dirt underneath that dished out area is generally the same color as everything else. 
Well, it's because it's dried out and the, the sun has bleached it out, and it's been that way for at least an extended period of time. Whereas what Jay's talking about is if a turkey walks up and goes scratch, 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 or Jay comes up and finds a, a scratched out area and goes, hmm, I want to check it, and he grabs a, a, a handful of stuff and scratches it himself, a lot of times if, if you see that there's a difference in color of the pine needles and a difference in color in the soil, it's because it hasn't bleached out yet. It hasn't dried out yet. Most of the time it's just a, a soil moisture issue. And, yes, you should be, depending on the habitat, most of the time, though, you should be able to tell – uh, just, just kind of how fresh something is. And the other thing too is if you have a dished out spot and stuff is growing out of it, well, then it's probably an older dished out area versus if it, if it's just bare or, you know, the green stuff that was growing in it is just kind of laid over and wilted, but it's still there. Well, then it's pretty fresh. Have you guys heard about phone scope? PhoneScope is a privately held company that makes custom-molded, precisely engineered smartphone digiscoping adapters. Photographing wildlife has never been easier. Take digiscoping photos and videos from your smartphone and share them with your friends. PhoneScope stands behind their product with a 100% money-back guarantee. PhoneScope is the future of digiscoping. Get yours now. Use the JScott16 promo code and receive 10% discount on all purchases. Check them out at Phonescope, that's P-H-O-N-E-S-K-O-P-E dot com, or on Instagram, at Phonescope. Wilderness Athlete is committed to improving the health and quality of life for the outdoor athlete by providing field-tested, scientifically validated nutrition and sports performance products. Check them out at WildernessAthlete.com and use the J. Scott promo code to receive 10% off any order. Yeah, good stuff. Um, moving on to strut marks. Um, strut marks are a great indication that you've got mature birds that are strutting. When a bird, well, let's talk about why a bird struts. Birds strutting to show dominance. Uh, bird struts to show off to the hens. Uh, it's a natural thing that the birds do. They can't, they you know fan their tail out and they drag their wings. And, um, I'll, you know, I've got some awesome strutting footage that I'll also put on my website for you guys to see if you don't know what strutting looks like. But I love to find fresh strut marks because usually fresh strut marks mean that, you know, that bird was there that day. And then even if I find strut marks in the uh, mud and it looks old, that tells me, okay, I try and determine, you know, is, is that, you know, four or five days old? Is that a week old? Is that two weeks old? That also starts to tell me what the behavior of those birds. Oh, here's strut marks in the mud, and they're already strutting. That's going to tell me that, hey, this could be an early spring. They're already getting after it. Here we are the first part of April, and I'm already seeing strut marks. In in my experience hunting um Merriams uh, in Arizona, New Mexico, and, and around uh, these parts, typically you're not going to see strut marks till you get into April. And as the as April progresses towards you know say the 10th, 11th, 12th, 15th, you know, and on, you're going to see more and more strut marks. Um, but if you do start seeing strut marks in March. To me, that's going to throw up a, a signal of, hey, they're already starting to strut. This season, it could be an early season. Or if you're not seeing any strut marks and you've, you're at the 15th of April, that's going to be telling me, hey, they might be a little bit behind this year and you know they might not be gobbling. The reason I'm not hearing gobbling is I'm not even seeing any strutting and 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 they're not even ready yet, Chris. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, a couple things, cu couple thoughts. Number one, strut marks. It, depending on how windy and how much track, if you look, if you find strut marks on those dried road beds, um, depending on how much activity is along that road and how windy it is, you can actually find those strut marks persist. I've I've found some of those strut marks persist. Uh, for quite some time because you got a gobbler that, that is really uh, getting after it on his strut. And when he pushes those wingtips into the ground, I mean, he, he's putting some force on there. So they can scratch 
pretty well into some really tough ground. And so if they scratch and they leave a mark, unless a vehicle drives over it or it gets really windy, those they, they can persist. But the same thing, like Jay just said, I still like seeing that because it tells me that, yes, in fact, we do have gobblers around here that are showing off. Now, I I know from my experience in some areas, heck, even out here in, you know, in, in Rio Grande country, if you have mature birds in the area, a lot of times the mature birds are going to be the ones that kind of kick off some of that strutting. A lot of times you, they're going to be one of the first ones out there doing it. However, if you have a lack of mature birds, those jakes will still strut. I mean, they, they'll they'll go crazy and you'll have a strut fest. So you can have jakes out there strutting as well. But in my opinion, in my experience, sometimes the jakes start really heavily strutting a little bit later than what the mature birds start doing. So if you're out there and all of a sudden, you know, like Jay said, it's the end of March and here's one set of strut marks and there's other tracks around, then I am. I'm like, I'm betting that my gambling nature, I'm going to say, mm, I think I'm going to gamble on that's going to be a more mature bird. Whereas if I get up there, and again, we're talking mountain birds in areas where we don't have huge numbers of birds, if I see a spot where we've got just multiple birds all strutting together, sometimes that can indicate you got a band of jakes that are all strutting. So not that it makes any difference depending on what birds you want, but just keep that in mind that, you know, I, you, you can get jakes out there strutting. But again, a lot of times they'll start just a little bit later than the mature birds do. That's all great stuff. Uh, Chris, I think we covered a, a bit, good bit of ground there on scouting turkeys uh, I think we're going to call this part one on scouting turkeys and uh, I'm going to encourage people to uh, listen to part two of roosting strategies uh, here in the western U.S., uh, roosting turkeys. So I want to thank you for being on and I look forward to speaking with you uh, on the roosting western uh, turkeys. Cool. Right on, man. Chris, I want to thank you for being on. I think we did a great job covering scouting turkeys here in the western U.S., I want to give you a chance to tell the listeners how they can find you. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. No, it's been fun. Uh, like always, folks can find me at just rowhuntingresources.com, just R-O-E, huntingresources.com. We've got the YouTube channel, just Row Hunting Resources, our Instagram or Facebook. All of it is just always rowhuntingresources.com. And so, you know, a lot of the stuff we talked about here, if, if people, you know, I mentioned before, you know, if you've if you got real grand turkeys, hunters or whatever, and you want to learn some of this stuff, it's going to be on your website, but they can also go on my turkey module and, and sign up for that and see a lot of the video and see some of that stuff as well, too. And if they do want to subscribe, like always, with your podcast, they can just type in the J. Scott podcast in the promo code section. It'll knock 20% off for them. So. Awesome. Yeah, and I want to encourage the listeners, Chris's Row Hunting Resources uh, not only is his elk module unbelievable, but his turkey, his Midwest uh, deer and turkey module is fantastic. And you have a lot of great Western turkey um, stuff on there. You've got a lot of Rio Grande turkey. You've got uh, New Mexico, uh, Merriam's and, and other uh, stuff on there. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Listeners, go check it out. Uh, you won't uh, you won't be sorry. Chris. I look forward to speaking with you on the Roosting Strategies uh, Part 2. Thank you, sir. I enjoyed it.